I did want to ask you more directly about Betsy. What is it she brings to that collaboration that empowers your storytelling in a way you couldn't do without her? Do you have any examples? Well, first of all, she has always believed in me, heart and soul. She has believed in me. She has believed in my writing. She has let me write what I wanted to write. Um, we might have a discussion about how a sequel would probably sell if I'd be willing to write one. And I know she wants them, but she never pushed me. Yeah. Um, she worked with me in whatever I wanted to write in my early career. It was a lot of experimentation. Some things work better than other things. I wanted to see how many different styles I could write because my books are all different styles. They're not just subjects, right. but the epic fantasy is a different style than the modern science fiction. I wanted to spread my wings. I wanted to exercise my writing ability. I wanted to find readers who would like me experimenting with different things. And she's always supported me and guided me. And she has tremendous insight into my work. Um, when she reads my work, she is able to put her finger on things that don't work and need improvement or need changes that fit my vision. And I have had, I, I have talked to some of that. She's the only editor I've had, but I've talked to some others in the process of getting to her being my editor who just didn't get it. And yeah. I sat there going, well, one suggested a happy ending for In Conquest Born where they got together. My two characters got together. And I just sat there and yeah. She loved the book. She just thought that the characters needed to, that needed to be the climax of the book that they get together. And, it was you it. know, I'm a new author and I didn't want to blow my chances. So I'm sitting there with the same friendly smile on my face thinking, oh my God, Gosh. you know, talk about missing the point. And yeah. uh, later when I talked to Betsy, Betsy's like, no, she did not get it. Um, so I know from other editors that they may not have, she has a tremendous gift of seeing what I'm trying to do, even if I haven't succeeded in doing it. And that's what she did with Nightborn. She looked at the scene. She says, I know what you're trying to get out of this, uh, but you didn't, get, you didn't get it on the paper. Yes. So she is a vital part of my creative process. And I can't even imagine my writing career without her. I can't imagine my career without her. And I can't imagine writing the books with what's in them without her input. But, you know, I had a good editor who let me write what I wanted. My career did well. The yeah. book sold well. I was able to write full time, which very, very few writers can do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it made me want you to, to have such a great appreciation for Betsy and what a team can build that you may not be able to do on your own. I have had a lot of experiences in life that I have been allowed to have because my theater background gave me a sense of collaboration that most writers don't have. Writers tend to be extremely egotistical. They're yeah. very problematic. They don't necessarily take criticism very well. They love their stuff. They don't want to be told it's not working. I came from theater where you put together some designs. You went to the meeting. The director said, that's not what I'm going for. And you might go home and curse him and have a little voodoo doll with pins in it. But you know that ultimately the goal is that we have to all be on the same page. Yes. And that means I might have a perfectly valid creative idea that just doesn't fit this project. Um, so I'm used to that. And I'm used to working with a team of people and that their input matters to what I'm doing. And I've taken that into the writing. So I've, I've been able to have good relationships with my cover artists where normally my editor wouldn't let an author near a cover artist for fear they defend them or be pushy or something. Yeah. But they know that I understand and respect their process and that anything I suggest I'm going to do in a way that is part of that process, not is you did a shitty job, change it to this, you know? Um, I can approach collaboration without ego getting in the way. And it's probably one of my most powerful skills. And that came from the theater years. What is it that engages you from someone else's storytelling? Well, I'm expressing my imagination. I don't know that I'll have a good answer for you on this one. Sure. I'm expressing my imagination. I'm channeling something inside myself. Mm. Somebody else isn't doing that. I enjoy the creative process. And when you create something that is awesome and you look at it and you get to kvell about it. Yeah, yeah. My, my dad was a technical writer and he would, uh, at night, we would, we'd have dinner and then he'd go in his office and he'd do his writing, magazine articles, and while we watch TV or something. And I remember he would come out sometime once and he would read a sentence to us. It was a sentence about some electronic equipment or something. 
and he would tell about how isn't is this not an awesome sentence is this not one of the great uses of the colon that you have ever seen in your life nice. and specifically i remember the colon concept where he said people do not use colons you know properly and creatively and they avoid using colons this is an awesome sentence with a colon in it the beauty of a single sentence was something he wanted to share with me yeah and when i write well when i have those moments when it's really flowing and i look at those sentences those are the moments i know that's in me i don't have the ability to tap it every single time i want so when it flows out it's like magic that makes sense. And I love that story about your dad because like that makes sense that even as a technical writer, if you're in love with the beauty of language and a perfectly phrased sentence. Right. And he raised me to understand that he said, it doesn't matter what you're writing. All writing is the same. He said there may be different rules about structure or something. He says, you're writing fiction, my writing technical articles. There, There is no form of writing. If you can do one, you can do them all. You know, the, the skills are the same. The skill set's the same. The goal is the same. Communication. I have such a hate on for any story that uses somebody being stupid to further the plot. At that point, and by stupid, I mean something so patently obvious to the reader that they can't believe the the person didn't pick it up. Yep. It's it's my personal hate. I hope to never do it. I try very hard to never do it. Now there are two flip there are flip sides to this. One is they have to never do anything stupid, but the other is if they do do something stupid you have to justify it. It doesn't mean they can't do something stupid, but it means you have to be in their head enough that you understand why and you buy it. Yeah. And as I said to Nikki, trying to do this again without spoilers, there are a couple of people who do things in Nightborn that later they wonder if it was the right thing to do. Uh, and it's kind of ambiguous whether it was the right thing to do, but I, what Betsy wanted me to do was make those moments of decision so clear that when they happened, we understood why that was the choice. Yeah. We understood why they weren't having the second thought that said, oh, but this could come from it. We had to, we had to see their reasoning and be in their head. I mean, to me, that's the beauty of fiction is that you get a reader to be able to experience someone else's psyche and to experience their paradigm and to see the world through their eyes. And of course, that's the interesting part about the Outworld series when you're dealing with neurodiversity. If I can put you in the head of someone who has a condition that you don't, yeah. you can experience that. And I mean, think of what a human connection that is to, yes. to grasp it in a way you can't possibly get from a textbook. Yes, you know? uh, and there's even a, um, a communal consciousness kind of effect when someone who sees, who feels represented by something in your book when they see that book doing well, it has a communal perception. I feel seen and I know how many other people are being seen because of how popular the book is. Well, that's good. Even though I've never experienced the gay side of things and all the all the issues that come with that while you're growing up, the core question of human identity, I, I think the foundation that's in us of how we deal with figuring out who we are and coming to terms with the parts of ourselves that we question or that other people question, those stories are really valuable to me. <laughs> so I actually, I felt struck and I must say seen by your comments to Nikki with iWizard about your world building around bio and neurodiversity. How for you, the people marginalized as different in your stories, just as we so often see in the real world, they're not lesser, but simply different. And those people see themselves as inherently worthy. Their differences are not limitations. Their differences are these unique opportunities. Um, and you said, quote, they are points of pride and constructive creativity rather than resentment. And I just wonder if you could expand on what you'd like to express about your own journey, pushing up against what people told you were limitations. And in what ways have you discovered your differences as worthiness? I was very fortunate in having parents that basically didn't talk about limitations or acknowledge them. Anything we wanted to do, they supported us. Um, my father taught me that anything you wanted to learn, you never knew when it would be valuable. Go ahead. If you want to take a weird course in something that seems to be unrelated to your life, do it because you never know. He gave us an example that he had a hobby of photography. And 20 years later, he started writing articles about electronic equipment and had to do his own photography. Wow. So 
they were totally behind this in every form, shape, or matter. Could not ask for better parents for this kind of thing at all. I have a I have a disorder that I'm dealing with for the next Alien Shore book, which I'm not going to mention because I would like it to surprise people. So getting around the spoiler will be hard. But it was a very tough one because I've I've taught kids who have this. I've dealt with it a lot. And I have never had anyone with it ever say there was any facet of it they were grateful for. I've seen people with autism write that there are facets of autism they're grateful for and they wouldn't change it if they could. Sure. Legitimately. Or some of them say, this is really hard to deal with, but this is the flip side and they kind of balance out, you know? I but understand. this is a condition where I've never heard anyone say that they wouldn't get rid of it in an instant if given the option. And so I just put out a call on some social networks. I said, anybody have this condition that has anything positive to say? And I actually found a couple of people wow. and they gave me tremendous insight into how that handicap could be viewed as a gift, which of course is what the whole Garen Society is about. Yeah. And that was the hardest one I've done because it's it doesn't lend itself to that. Autism does. Autism has benefits in concentration and other things that are kind of easy to point to. It's like, you have to get all the societal expectations out of the way and clear out the crud. Yes. But there are things that it gives you in yeah. return for all the difficulty, but there are other conditions where it's not as obvious. So even what seems more normal now that we've spoken to many more people with DID and we have a lot more information, it was like in the mystery darkness back then. I mean, it wasn't even on the research shelves and it was so hard to find any information or anyone to talk to. So that was a real challenge. I, I was writing something that I kind of knew could exist, but I had very few records of when it did exist. There was one book, When Rabbit Howls, hmm. but that had a flavor of popular writing to it that I wasn't totally sure about trusting any of it. She had a kind of group consciousness where they all talk to each other, but the book didn't feel like it was necessarily going for the hardcore, precise depiction of exactly what happened. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was a little kind of romanticized and dressed up. So I wasn't sure how much to trust it. Right. Right. Uh, especially back then. Well, I think you did a really good job. Uh, what I, Thank you so much. What I love about it is even the parts that didn't resonate with me didn't feel as though it was in conflict with my experience. And I right. think that's the goal. sometimes what feels insulting about other representations where I feel as though I need to argue with them, but that's not what I experience. And I don't feel, I feel seen by what I read in your stories, not challenged. Thank you. Well, I want you to feel like what you experience is part of a spectrum in which I may be exploring a different part of it. Yeah. But the fact that I'm exploring it doesn't mean the other parts don't exist. Right. And best example I can give you is the word autism never exists in this alien shore. I have a character whose personality and mental state are based on, they're, mo they're modeled on autism, but it's never said that he's autistic. And he doesn't have to be exactly autistic. It could be another condition that has many of the same qualities, yes. but not exactly the same qualities. And that gives me the freedom to not worry about anyone trying to pin me down because I'm not saying autistic people act like this. I'm saying this character who is kind of of this type does this yes. and you can see the connection, but he's not setting an example for anyone. Yes. Um, as I said, and I, and I, uh, I hesitate to give out details of anything because it takes me so long to write. Um, I am going to be dealing with uh, body dysphoria. In the next book, not particularly gender. I'm, I mean, that's I'm avoiding that, and that's not what it's about. But the concept that one's body is not correct and is not right and yes. cannot be accepted. Yes. Um, and I'm going to deal with that, and I hope it'll be interesting and kind of dark because you know I'm a dark writer, so the dark side of everything is what I'm looking at. But I do want to explore that very much, and I have a number of trans friends who I'm talking to a lot. I mean, it's it's a different experience because the gender thing is a little different than what I'm doing in the book, but it's that same sense that you're trapped in a body that isn't right. It yeah. isn't correct. And you're not going to be able to come to terms with it the way it is. Mm -hmm. So um, trappedness, I think, is what I what I get from them, you know?
Yes. And um, so that will be one of the themes of the next book. Wow. And hopefully, hopefully that will resonate with a lot of people. I think so. And I think it will be timely. Very, very timely. My hope is that's a very thin line to walk it. So the prop, the question in the next book is going to be, if you could actually make the change you wanted, would that satisfy? Yes. Or is there something in you that's not going to be satisfied and it's just going to find a new channel? So yes. that's a very deep and disturbing question. And um, that's what allows science fiction allows us to explore. Right. You know, because in this, in this world, there are changes you can't make. But in my world, I can create whatever situation I need. Yeah. Qu quite a challenge for yourself. But honestly, it feels like you're not interested unless it's quite that challenging. You need to be able to reach for something so powerful and profound. If it's not going to have a paradigm shifting effect on your readers, why? And especially for this series, because the oh. second book, I really enjoy it. I love the characters. It's the same diverse world. But some of my readers were disappointed that it wasn't so focused oh. on somebody's mental somebody's cognitive state oh, I see. you know what i mean I see. it wasn't the story wasn't as dependent upon that element so we're going to go back to that but this is the first one where i had a discussion with my editor and i said this is what i'm thinking of i said this is probably be the hardest thing i've ever written wow. and i'm not sure i can do it because there is a level but it's not mostly this it's mostly because i'm dealing with the diversity element that i told you before where people don't see good things in it <laughs> and i said how do i how do I put my reader into a mindset that can't focus on the plot properly? You know what I mean? How do I make that work that I'm telling the story, but it may not be something where my character is connecting to every part of the story. And she said, she felt I could do it. She said, you did the multiple personality thing. After that, I think you can do anything. Right. But this one has, this one is going to have some serious challenges for me as a writer. And I did put off the multiple personality for many years. I knew that I wanted to do a multiple personality character. And I knew when I was a young writer, I wasn't ready for it. Yeah. And I needed my writing skill to get to a certain point before I was going to tackle something like that. Uh, well, I think at this point, you've earned our trust. Thank you. That means a lot. So what, wh Celia, what do you hope you're remembered for? I hope people are still reading my books forever. Hmm. I hope... I it's I think my claim to fame is going to be the Cold Fire trilogy. Yeah, uh, it was started 30 years ago, long time, and it's still showing up on lists of best fantasies ever. I want to be on those lists. I want 50 years from now when people talk about the best fantasies ever written, I want to make those lists. Might not make the top 10, but I'd like to get in like the top 50 or so. And you know that's immortality, and and it's so much my voice. And my issues and the things that matter to me go into those books. Um, and with the Outworld series, I'd like to bring something positive into the world for people who deal with neurodiverse conditions, because this is a very powerful way to do it. And I know how many people I've gotten feedback from that just reading about a world where the conditions are accepted and celebrated rather than treated like something is wrong meant so much to people who are struggling to come to terms with their own issues yeah. you know just even to have the fantasy that this would be possible and to be shown how it could work means a lot to people who are really trying to sort out their own identities um i didn't mention it before many 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 years ago i was invited to do guest of honor for galacticon hmm. and i said that's really interesting because I'm like not only not gay, but I have never in my life written a single gay thing. I think I went back and in Conquest Born, there's one passing mention that sometimes men have sex with men because I just couldn't ignore it. I mean, it had to at least be, you know, mentioned in there. But I mean, I've never dealt with the subject. Why are you asking me? And he said, they love your work. They just love your work. They want you. And I had one of the most fascinating weekends of my life. And um oh. I had lunch with a lot of trans people talking to them about issues of identity. Oh, no, I was working on a Magister trilogy. You have the contrast of a woman who has entered a male world and absolutely not been willing to compromise her female identity. Contrast with the one who was. Yes. One who made that sacrifice. Yes. 
And that's not a lengthy in-depth thing, but it really has to ring true, you know, because that's the moment when the author, the reader hopefully goes, holy shit, I didn't even think about that. But why am I assuming these are all really men? Yes. You know? um, and yeah. it helped me so much to have that weekend. The lead in on the film, because you, you said it's something about using the fade to reach me i mean what's coming before this yeah so um what i'm what i'm imagining at the moment before our conversation and you know i'll just uh, you, as you know drafting you don't really know until you have it the deeper we get into your timeline the more fay we are collecting for working until we'll get to a third part that's a direct conversation with you as though we have finally got enough human intention collected and enough. <laughs> right? So you're, you're gathering the global conglomerate of people who want to talk to Celia. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I mean, I just think of it as a kind of storytelling device, sort of like Peter Pan, when okay. they bring in, they would get the audience to clap to bring Tinkerbell back to life. Right. And I want the audience that's watching this to feel as though watching it has in itself contributed to bringing you into the video. And then you'll help me get out like book reviews until you're ready to go read it. Uh, I'm going to make this the biggest thing I've ever been a part of. <laughs> oh, I love you. Oh, thank you. Bless you. Bless you. Right. I, I, I want to offer people something new and, and a little bit richer for people who may already be familiar with your work. I know that video things and YouTube things and everything are a valuable tool these days and any help you want to offer and getting word out, I'd appreciate it. You're the best. I appreciate you. So anyway, I guess, you know, congratulations on being the storyteller I'm most interested in to put my attention towards you, but. Oh my God, <laughs> I'm blushing, I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs>